ってるようだな<笑> Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host with another marvelous video This time, Top 50 Horror Anime Explored Horror animes are the peak of artistic creativity and depravity, in our opinion There's something about the sense of dystopian doom that some horror animes manage to capture that change the way an entire generation of people think about their own worlds. If it's true that every element of world building is exaggerated when it's part of a cartoon, then it's also true for every emotion it evokes. And trust us when we say, by the end of this list, you're not going to want to watch some of these shows just to avoid the nightmares. So, without further ado, here are Marvelous Video's Top 50 Horror Animes Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please subscribe. Support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. <laughs> Parasite 2014. In 1979, Ridley Scott changed the sci fi genre on its head with the release of his seminal film Alien. In 1988, Hitoshi Iwaki took it a step further and managed to somehow make the prospect of an alien species invading your body even more. Horrific. Parasite is a sci fi horror manga that focuses on the titular parasites, a race of alien beings who have arrived on Earth with a single purpose to assimilate and eliminate the most intelligent sentient species on the planet. No one knows where these parasites came from or why they chose Earth as their hunting ground, but one thing becomes clear to us rather quickly. They're highly intelligent and also possess a voracious appetite for the very species that they choose as their hosts. Our protagonist is Shinichi Izumi, a nice and thoughtful high school student who unfortunately has a bit of a diary of a wimpy kid situation going on for him and also has crippling entomophobia. So, you can imagine how terrified he must have been when the bug like larva of a parasite attacks him one night in an attempt to take his body over. Parasites look like translucent glowworms with protruding eyes and are actually kind of beautiful, to be honest with you guys.、Hmm. That's until you remember they have a drill on their mouths that they use to literally burrow into a human being's brain, and then they become decidedly less adorable. Shinichi must embark on a quest to eliminate these invaders who end up taking everything that makes him human from him. His mother, His normal life, and indeed his very humanity. Parasite is a series that makes you really understand the cost of evolving as we currently understand it, and shows you that the true horror lies not within the face unraveling monsters that had arrived on Earth, but in losing your humanity to them despite cooperating with one of them. Shinichi's gradual descent into an emotionless cleanser of parasite filth. Is one that is familiar, and that's exactly why it's terrifying to behold. Well, that, and the mincemeat murders, and the literal human feeding factories that the parasites build as the series approaches its endgame. And yes, you heard us right. What are these things? Where did they come from? They will come. They will come. Berserk, 1997. 2016. Naming things after literal objects or feelings feels unwarranted. Lazy, plain corny, doesn't it? I mean, when I realized that the love and thunder in the recent Thor film stood for the literal team up he has with Gore's daughter, I immediately laughed out loud in my seat. But if there's one character whose name fits the lifestyle and the experiences he's been made to suffer through literally since he was born, then it's guts. Because, man. The world of Berserk will drive you insane. Demons, apostles, and men fight over a land that is somehow both better and worse than your worst post apocalyptic dreams. And then some. Our protagonist, the aforementioned Guts, is a spiteful cynic of a brute whose sole concern is survival and nothing else. You'd think that it's a very harsh way to live life, but what would you think of life when you were born as your mother was being executed and then left to die by the man who was supposedly your father? Or when that same man tries to sell you off for a few coins to a random stranger just because he needs to get drunk that night? Or when the man you thought was your best friend? Ends up sacrificing all of your companions and violating the love of your life just because he now can. Life in the late great Kentaro Miura's berserk universe is less than bleak, and in such an environment, you can't blame Guts for not trusting anyone who crosses his path. Just the sheer scale of betrayal and terror that depends upon his life due to the decisions of other men is enough to generate a sense of horror so deep within you that you'll not want to continue with the series after a point. We tend to think of life as something that always presents us with a positive solution at our lowest through some sort of divine intervention. But Berserk shows you that divinity is nothing but the congregation of human emotions, and most human emotions tend to deviate towards the primal drive to commit evil acts. Desire, vengeance, fury, these are the seeds that nourish the people that inhabit this mad world, and those who embrace them fully whilst discarding all else are the only ones who can truly ascend. <laughs> A curse upon you!、Oh, Junji Ito Collection. 
2018. And we have a conversation about Japanese horror mangas without Junji Izo coming up more than once? Hmm, the answer is no, and this series is evidence of that. This 12-episode anthology sees some of Ito's best short stories and horrors come to life thanks to Studio Dean. Each episode itself has two parts, with each part telling its own story, and the original run ended with a two-part OVA of Ito's foundational horror manga, Tomi. It starts off with the bleak and sadistic life of Ito's other recognizable go-to, Soichi, and from there, things devolve rather quickly into a smorgasbord of horrors. Emotional, mental, physical, and metaphysical. Fashion Model tells the story of a hideous performance artist with more than an inferiority complex, and the intersection's pretty boy has some ugly secrets in his closet that his homecoming ends up digging out without his consent. Slug Girl and My Dear Ancestors will make you think xenomorphs are pretty, and Lord Ravana was a kind gentleman with its hellish body horror, while House of Marionettes will make you question what the true cost of artistic beauty is. Our personal favorite from this series is Second Hand Record, which is a tale about a haunted and unmarked jazz record made by an artist as she was about to die. The record symphony is so hypnotic that whoever listens to it immediately feels entitled to owning it and will go to any lengths to recover it. And as if that wasn't disturbing enough, if you happen to die because of an event that involved the song, then the music of the haunted record will continue to emanate from your dead body. It's one of Ito's finest philosophical takes on the beauty of the pursuit of great art, and the price that extracts not just from your body, but also your soul. If you're looking to casually fall into an existential crisis and have endless nightmares about what you just saw, then get your Crunchyroll subscription ASAP and go watch this collection because it's truly a masterpiece in horror. They first appeared over a hundred years ago. Giant humanoid creatures with a taste for horror. Attack on Titan 2013. In the year 850, humanity lives within three major living zones protected by massive walls. The inhabitants of these walled cities are the only remnants of the human species, which has been locked in an eternal battle with massive humanoid monsters called Titans. Eren Jaeger, a strong-willed and impulsive yet caring young man, lives within the walls with his family and friends, when one day the world, as he knows it, comes to an end. Several massive, deformed and malevolent Titans break through his home city's walls and begin indiscriminately slaughtering everyone in sight, including Eren's mother. He watches as a grotesque Titan takes her life, seemingly mocking him with the disconcerting grin that's permanently stuck on its face. That day, he vows to kill every Titan he comes across, and thus begins a journey that shows you how all-consuming the idea of revenge can be and also how terrifying it is in the hands of someone with immense power. Attack on Titan's story begins with the biggest lie that humanity has been told, and as it unravels the truth, it shows you how the idea of leaving some questions unanswered can actually be a good thing. Detachment, disillusionment, delusion, and rage are things that begin affecting Eren on that day, but by the time you reach the halfway mark of the story, you aren't just excited by his actions in service of his revenge, but are actively concerned for him. Because in his quest to avenge his mother's life, Eren becomes the very villain he once vowed to destroy, and becomes the source of countless horrors himself. Looking in the background of all of this are the highly disturbing Titans, whose grins and diet would honestly make you give up eating food altogether. And uh, if you knew what they ate, you'd want to lock yourself in an underground bunker and never come out again, too. Eren's story sees him commit one horrifying act after another in defense of the ideals he holds dear to himself, and sees him lose his metaphorical and literal humanity to a conflict that started generations ago. Wicked City, 1987 Wicked City is a movie that captures manga author Hideyuki's trademark provocativeness as tastefully as it can, with a color palette that makes it feel like Akira in a grindhouse. Centuries ago, humanity realized that their world exists in conjunction with another dimension, which they labeled as the Black World, a land of demons and shapeshifters. For centuries, the Black World and ours have had a peace accord with each other thanks to a secret core of elite operatives known as the Black Guard, whose members come from both worlds. Renza Bioro Taki is a regular white-collar salaryman who works for an electronic company and lives a regular life. He has a regular routine, a regular drink, and a girl in his life called Kanako, with whom he engages in regular, casual sex. On one such night, when Taki is supposed to embark on yet another tryst with her, he's surprised to find her more exhilarated than usual. After some frantic and passionate lovemaking, Taki realizes that the person he's been coupling with is not Kanako, but in fact, an entity from the Black World. The entity shapeshifts to resemble a humanoid spider and tries to kill Taki as soon as she's discovered by leaving him alive, having accomplished her mission, acquiring a sample of his semen. 
Now, usually, if someone you're sleeping with transforms into a friggin' spider, you'd probably die of shock there and then. But our boy Tucky is a part of that enigmatic black guard, and it now becomes his mission to hunt down that spider woman and her comrades, who are part of a group of radical demons looking to destroy the peace between humanity and demonkind. Tucky is partnered with a woman called Maki, and though their relationship quickly evolves into intimacy, the hurdles they have to leap over to get to that point comprise the true horror of this story. Wicked City uses lust, eroticism, and the act of copulation to show us how vulnerable those moments can truly render a person, and how that vulnerability, if shared with the wrong person, leads to truly horrific consequences. The 80s aesthetic of the movie makes it that much more appealing in its moments of levity, and that much more terrifying in its climactic encounters, with a surreal sense of, is all of this even real, running through your mind as you watch it fly by. Taki and Maki's relationship revolutionizes the way both societies view and function with each other, but they survive through literal hell and back to get there. What's your name? Please tell me. Mei. Mei Misaki. Another 2012. Grief is only a natural response to something as serious and saddening as a sudden death, but holding on to that grief can be dangerous, even fatal. In 1972, Misaki Yomiyama, a star student of the ninth grade class 3-3, passed away mysteriously. His entire school loved him because he was a truly kind prodigy child, but the love his class had for him surpassed all others. One day, being unable to accept his death, one of his classmates proclaimed that Misaki was still there, sitting at his desk and talking with them. Everyone else soon picked up the same habit, including some of their teachers, and for the rest of the year, Misaki Yomiyama's memory was kept alive. Everything was going well, until graduation day when they decided to put his desk in the class picture and found his ghost in it instead. From that day onward, Class 3-3 was afflicted with the curse of the extra student, and the payment this curse exacted was a sudden and horrific death. 26 years later, 9th grade student Koichi Sakakibara and his enigmatic classmate Mai Misaki seek to end the curse once and for all, but their journey leads them to places neither of them want to go, culminating with a truly tragic example of a needless death. Another is an anime where the stakes aren't instantly clear, and a lot of the times it feels more like a commentary on discrimination, but if you lean into those things then you can begin to appreciate the horrifying prospect that is a collective decision to not move on from death, leading to people being marked for it as their reward. Some of the deaths in the show come out so out of left field you can't help but exclaim, holy crap, as you clutch your racing heart in your hands. Just look up another anime teacher death on YouTube, and you'll understand what we're talking about. Death Note 2006-2007 The gateway anime for most people who haven't tried it out yet. Death Note is more of a detective anime than a horror anime in popular perception because the main characters are detectives themselves, but <laughs> make no mistake, this is peak psychological horror at full display. A young and ambitious high school student with a strong sense of morality and on the track to becoming a policeman finds a tool that can revolutionize his quest for justice. A mysterious notebook falls out of the realm of the Shinigami and lands right in front of Light Yagami as he's going to class one day. And and thus begins the infamous legend of Kira and the Death Note. We're not going to spend too much time talking about the details of this show because most of you all know them already, but we're going to tell you why it lands on this list as a horror anime. It's because the very concept of morality is violated as the foundation of a crusade, which gives rise to a cult dedicated to their one true leader. Holding power over life and death is something that can easily corrupt one with a strong moral compass, if they lack the willpower to reinforce said morality at all times. Over the course of the thousands of lives he takes, which also include many non criminal test subjects and pawns, you see that, like Yagami and Kira, are two different people, and nowhere does this become clearer when Light gives up possession of the Death Note. The sheer horror he expresses at his own actions, despite having forgotten them, is all you need to know about the way power corrupts even the best of us and reduces them to nothing more than feral dogs. The final confrontation Kira has with Nier's team is the real face of Light Yagami, and the animation team did a great job to express the true terrors of this man's crusade of justice. Light might be cool, but Elle was right. Taking a life just because you can is just as big of a crime as any of his victims committed, and Light Yagami dies as the most notorious serial killer in history, not the god Demigawa and the rest of his followers tried to make him. Higurashi when they cry, 2006. Now, this is a story that might just put it, Stranger Things, in any other sleepy town with a secret horror to shame. Keiichi Mebara arrives in the village of Hinamizawa and quickly develops a liking for the place. It's quaint, scenic, and the locals have a popular custom known as the Watanagashi Festival, dedicated to their local deity, Oyashiro. 
which usually brings the whole place to life. He even makes tons of friends like the twins Mayon and Shion, and the rest of the gang which includes Reina, Rika and Satoko. And yet the very first scene of the very first episode of Higurashi when they cry shows you Kaichi brutally murdering two of his friends with a baseball bat as something akin to a temporal loop begins playing out as the episode progresses. This series has a clever premise in that it basically uses alternate realities and the reset button so offensively that it tricks you into believing things that are expressly not concrete or making you question other things you thought were set in stone. But within this framework, the developers at 07th Expansion were able to create a mystery that's as compelling as it is terrifying. Turns out, for the last four years, several people have been dying or disappearing on the day of the Watanigashi Festival, with many residents terming the latter event as a transfer. And as Kaichi digs deeper into the mystery of these deaths, the story starts making you realize that the rage and visceral deaths are just the start of it. Things could be a lot worse, as later episodes of the anime will make you realize. Higurashi, when they cry, is like Happy Death Day, but without any of the warmth or sass of tree. It's all cold logic and brutal murders, and time loops and alternate realities, and teenagers drinking sake to level themselves out, which honestly sounds more relatable than anything else on this list so far. The overarching antagonist of the series is ostensibly the village of Hinemazawa itself, and if that doesn't translate into you watching it, well, we don't know what will. Mononoke 2006. Oftentimes, horror is derived not from the things we understand to be terrifying, but from things we can't even process or comprehend with our minds. Mononoke is a series that somehow combines both of those things, giving you a concentrated story about a man's journey to purge people of evil spirits in an animation style that can only be described as a fever dream playing out in front of you. An offshoot of the same year's Ayakashi Samurai Horror Tales, Mononoke follows the medicine seller from that series as he makes his way through the land, coming across and exercising the titular Mononoke. Vengeful spirits, dead spirits, spirits that tend to possess other individuals and cause them immense suffering in some form or the other. The series is set during the transitional phase between the Edo and Meiji eras, meaning samurais were still the prominent warrior class of Japanese society. Which is why most characters are shocked and outraged at the fact that the medicine seller carries with him an enchanted sword. He uses the sword to exercise the mononoke he encounters, but in order to do so, three conditions must be met. He must know the form of the spirit, the truth of the circumstances under which it manifested, and the reason it continues to exist. These restrictions create a unique storytelling device that the animators at Toei decide to express through page after page of surrealist interpretations of traditional Japanese art. Indeed, at times Mononoke feels more like a picture book than an anime, but trust us when we say, you're not ready for this show. The frequent camera cuts, the jarring camera movements, the way every scene plays out with a jack, and how the art style simply leaves you unnerved. Mononoke is practically waking life on drugs, and if that isn't disorienting and terrifying in your books, then eh, we don't know what is. Mushishi 2006. Move over, Asuma Sensei. We might just have a new favorite smoker anime character after all. Mushishi is essentially a story about a traveling exorcist who finds and eliminates creatures known as Mushi. But the context within which his work falls is so morally ambiguous that you're left thinking if he's a savior or a hunter. And neither answer is going to be satisfactory, which is sort of the point. Ginko is a Mushi master, aka Mushishi, who wanders through a fictional version of transitioning Japan, which is somehow both futuristic and primitive. Certain forms of 20th century technology exists within this world, yet it's an isolationist Japan that Ginkgo wanders through, not one that opened its shores to the world beyond. And the latter setting is what allows for the story to have an ethereal sense of otherworldliness, because, huh, turns out, the Mushi are actually the purest forms of life in existence. They are essentially phantom parasites that latch onto animals and humans alike, and often congregate within rural areas, for they are untouched by the impurity of modernity. Ginko's very nature is a dichotomy as well, but though his main job is to hunt the Mushi, he's also a Mushi magnet, and must smoke special Mushi tobacco constantly to keep them off his own person. But Ginko doesn't see them as a menace to society that needs to be culled. He acknowledges the parasitic nature of a Mushi and its right to existence, perhaps feeling more deeply for them than anyone else. In a conversation with a heartbroken woman who was about to willingly give herself over to a Mushi, Ginko explains that her loneliness is nothing compared to the very manifestation of that emotion with the Mushi exist through in their own domain. He's able to successfully talk her out of her folly, and it's moments like these where you see the true beauty and horror of this story. Mushishi doesn't use soundtracks throughout the episode, instead opting to allow eerie silences to guide your viewing experience. Its philosophy on life is what should make your blood run cold, though we must admit the animation here is as beautiful as it gets. Watching this series is like being transferred into a melancholic song about a Shakespearean tragedy, and those are horrifying enough if you have half a heart.
Lily Cat, 1987. If you've ever wondered what a mashup of Ridley Scott's Alien and John Carpenter's The Thing would look like with a splash of 2001 A Space Odyssey all wrapped up within a feline, then this is the oddly specific movie you've been looking for. Lily Cat is literally a combination of all those movies and their plot lines, but far surpasses them because they have a friggin' kitty cat as its main body-melting, consciousness-assimilating, body-imitating alien virus. In the 23rd century, the Syncam Corporation is sent out a surveyor team to a newly discovered planet in order to determine its resource value. The entire crew enters cryogenic sleep for 20 years to complete the journey as painlessly as possible, but along the way, their ship comes across a strange asteroid field and takes on a sample of what's going to be the literal death of them all. By the time they wake up and realize something has gone terribly wrong, there are already two imposters on the ship, and a deadly game of Among Us begins which involves pink space dust strangling beautiful women, an imposter literally melting in front of the crewmates of the ship just to flex its power on them, and a Lovecraftian depiction of the virus which we can only describe as the most hideous 10 seconds of our lives. Lily Cat has a familiar story, and many of its core elements feel poorly rehashed, but if you're into campy slaughter and a cheesy 3-in-1 visual experience, then this is definitely one movie you should watch out for. Seriously, when the cat becomes an AI and starts talking trash to the crewmates is when you'll realize that crap has truly hit the fan in the best and worst possible ways. <laughs> You're nothing but dog food. Helsing, 2001. The first adaptation based on Kuta Hirano's terrifying manga about vampires is, admittedly, far quieter than its source material. If you watch the 2001 anime adaptation of Helsing, you'll think you're watching a Japanese interpretation of Hellboy, because that's how the show's creators approached Hirano's story. Helsing focuses on the workings of the titular Helsing Organization, a group dedicated to eradicating supernatural threats to Great Britain, which mostly occur in the form of vampires. The organization is led by Sir Integra Helsing, the last of his line, who can trace his lineage all the way back to Dr. Abraham Van Helsing, the lead character of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And speaking of Dracula, he's not only present in the story, but serves as its protagonist as well. Alucard has existed for centuries, and after his fateful encounter with Abraham Van Helsing, he was offered a choice. He could die, or fight by his side and help protect the world from more threats like him. The former Count chose the latter option, and has been fighting knockoffs of himself ever since, all the way into the 20th century. Helsing 2001 is a controversial series because it's so toned down in its content from its source material that it's almost like an entirely different show. But <laughs> make no mistake, everything that made Kuta Hirano's work iconic in the first place is still present here. Alucard may fight for the good guys, but some of the things he does in the name of said goodwill will make you bypass pity and empathize with the bad guys. He's the definition of the overpowered protagonist trope, and the time that you don't spend marveling at his powers, you'll spend squirming at his actions. And if you're interested in what a more faithful adaption of his antics might look like, then just keep watching this video. <laughs> Devilman Crybaby 2018. The one thing that makes horror fiction digestible is the promise that, well, at the end of it, things will resemble some form of the word alright. Sure, there'll be consequences, but the ultimate outcome will see every surviving character grow because of their experiences. But what happens when there's no one left to learn from what humanity goes through on a daily basis, and all that's left at the end is a sea of blood? a patch of rock, two fallen angels, and God hitting the reset button. The original anime series based on Go Nagai's Devilman series was good, but the 2018 ONA is a masterpiece. Devilman Crybaby focuses on the lives of two characters, Akira Fudo and Ryo Asuka. They've been best friends since a young age, but there's a peculiar trait that permeates their relationship. Ryo has never been an expressive human being, going so far as to not cry under circumstances that would warrant it. So Akira, who's more sensitive and understanding in this series than in his original incarnation, becomes Ryo's crybaby, often expressing his grief for him. This seemingly odd quirk comes back around at the end of the 10-episode series, when Akira is the one who becomes emotionless and Ryo is the one who bursts into tears like a baby that has just been born. Devilman Crybaby is a show where the stakes never stop rising, and that inevitable it's gonna be alright moment never comes to pass. There is betrayal here so deep and shocking that it'll leave your guts in nuts, and every episode further descends into what we can only term as biblical madness. Seriously, just when it looks like Akira is about to pull through and save the world, the world decides to dig its own grave with renewed aplomb. 
The final scene of Devilman Crybaby is loaded with so many emotions that it alone makes the show worthy of being labelled as a horror anime masterpiece, and you need to go out of your way to watch this one. But be warned, because things get very real very fast, and they do not take their foot off the gas once in the entire series. Cheeky 2010. When a species that threatens humankind with extinction appears on the pages of any horror fiction, the usual assumption is that this species is dangerous to all mankind and should therefore be eliminated. But what happens when, in its quest to protect itself, humanity proves that it's more monstrous than any other race of beings? That is exactly the story that Fuyumi Ono Shiki aims to tell. A mysterious illness has begun afflicting the residents of Sotoda at about the same time that the Kurashiki family moves into the village. Now it's a race against time to determine the cause of the illness and stamp it out root and stem for Dr. Toshio Ozaki, as he realizes the threat isn't exactly as medical as he first thought it to be. Shiki translates to corpse demon or death spirit in Japanese, but the real demons of this series are the humans who try to kill the Shiki. In his quest to save his wife from her impending Shiki transformation, Ozaki performs horrendous experiments on her, which the show doesn't hesitate from showing you. The Shiki are terrifying to be sure, especially the recently transformed ones who won't even hesitate from feeding on their biological parents, but the show makes it a point to show you that humans are worse. If the many gruesome and graphic Shiki deaths at the hands of the villagers of Satoda aren't evidence enough for you, then just look at how the villagers turn on the families of the very people trying to help them out in the first place. Mob mentality and primal bloodlust are at full display in the show, and to call it disturbing and unnerving would be an understatement. The mini-war between the Shiki and the humans is a prime example of a species fighting to survive from invasive predators, but the true horror of the series is determining who the real threat is, because after what the villagers of Satoda to do to the Kirishikis, it becomes clearer than ever that no matter what species tries to encroach on our lands, mankind can always outworse them. Perfect Blue 1997. This is the first entry on this list to not feature any kind of supernatural element within it, and yet it's also by far the scariest as well. Perfect Blue is Satoshi Kon's crowning achievement as an anime director, and also one of the most influential anime movies to permeate Western culture. It follows the life of J-pop idol turned actress Mimi Kirigo, and how her time in the entertainment industry and everything that comes with it has gradually chipped away at her sanity to lay bare the psychosis within. Or, so we're led to believe for most of the film's runtime. Perfect Blue is a psychological thriller executed so well that it would make Hitchcock proud. There are no implications of a higher power at work here, no absurd natural phenomena to anchor the character's gradual loss of sanity, just pure emotion, perception, adaptation, and the consequences of all those things. Idol culture in Asian countries is a thriving business for the corporations that engage in them, but is a personal nightmare for the idols themselves. Many of them are forced to maintain a squeaky clean image and put up with absurd amounts of stalking, all in the name of art. And when the idol wants to expand their creative horizon, Horizons, many of their fans can turn sour on them, with some even going too far as to wanting to rectify those mistakes. But in that process, important personal concepts like identity and stability and finding your own purpose are lost, and it's with those core emotional concepts that Satoshi Kon paints this terrifying picture of an artist losing their minds to their art itself. Mimi's decision to leave her group Cham upsets many of her fans and friends within the industry, but she's determined to create a new path for herself as an actress. But what happens when the people people who had followed her journey so far decide to put her back on it by taking matters into their own hands. The answer is what Perfect Blue explores with such raw psychosis on display here that you don't even question Mimi not being crazy for a second. It's one of the best psychological horrors ever made, and directly influenced Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream, which is one of the bleakest portrayals of drug culture in mainstream media today. Perfect Blue is a movie that will make you question your own interpretations of what's unfolding in front of your eyes, because after all, if the characters themselves are confused, Used, how can you, the viewer, find any clarity? <laughs> Tokyo Ghoul 2014. Imagine having possibly the greatest date of your life with a girl that's absolutely out of your league, walking her back home through a secluded alleyway, and her making a move on you to devour your flesh like hyenas eat a corpse. That's how Tokyo Ghoul begins, and it doesn't get any better for our lead character, Ken Kaniki. Kaniki is a sweet, bookish boy who's endured a lot growing up with an abusive parent. He holds his humanity dear to himself, wearing a disarmor, almost, and that ideology of his is tested when his encounter with Rize Kamishiro leaves him on the verge of 
death. With no other option remaining to him, the doctor decides to transplant her organs within Kaniki to save his life, but inadvertently turns him into a half-human and half-ghoul. Ghouls in this world are creatures who eat human flesh to survive because there's nothing else that they can consume. Drinking coffee keeps the hunger at bay, but the only way a ghoul's body derives nutrition is through human flesh. So, you can imagine the kind of trauma this put Kaniki through. He who held his humanity so close to his heart and wore it on his sleeve. His life gets darker with every passing episode, even though he manages to find friends at Anteku, a coffee shop run by ghouls because he fundamentally can't accept what he's become. And when he does, it comes to a point where he's broken beyond repair. The first three quarters of Tokyo Ghoul is terrifying, as it's because the show manages to make you feel every inch of Kaniki's terror at what he's becoming. But it's his breaking and remaking by Jason that makes his story go from tragedy to straight up slasher fiction. After enduring days of unbearable torture, which includes centipedes being put inside his ears, Kaniki embraces his inner ghoul and becomes the terror of Tokyo. He becomes a ghoul cannibal, and in season two develops a kakuja that is the very definition of insanity. His encounter with the Arata squad is something you should go out of your way to watch. And remember, don't ask him what's 1000 minus 7, because you'll not like the answer. Gantz, 2004. Gantz is an anime that would find fervent followers in grindhouses if they were still a thing. While the premise of the show itself is bizarre, What's so disturbing about it is the way it manages to depict the disgusting and ugly side of death in such a graphic fashion. The show begins with two friends called Kai Kurono and Masaru Kato trying to help a homeless drunk off some subway tracks that he'd fallen onto. The boys manage to save his life, but then they hear the sound of the train approaching and are in a race against Japan's most significant transportation-based innovation. Normally, any other anime would have them jump onto the platform at the last moment and then transition into a montage about how these two friends had always been there for each other, but that wasn't going to be the case for too long, but Gantz takes the realistic way out and kills them immediately. <laughs> and they aren't kind about it either, showing us that a subway collision somehow managed to decapitate both of them. And then things get more bizarre as the boys wake up in a room and are told that they're definitely dead, but now they're part of a game. A game that involves hunting aliens. Turns out, Earth is populated by hundreds of aliens that people can't see because they come from a different dimension. So, to fight these ghost-like invaders, you need actual ghosts. And for each ghost you kill, you get points that you can use to upgrade your arsenal or revive a dead teammate. Uh, except it isn't all that simple. You'll understand when you see the show. What makes Gantz so horrifying, however, is its love for Giallo-esque violence. Fans of The Boys will know Victoria Neumann as the head popper assassin who's currently leading the run for vice president of the USA and the cause of most graphic deaths on screen. Well, exploding heads is the baseline for Gantz. People literally end up getting deleted from existence in front of your very eyes. The characters in this show die such sudden and gruesome deaths that you'll end up de sensitized to all of it by the time you're through. And to top it all off, it manages to make you feel for all of its characters, including the very aliens whom they're supposed to be hunting as part of their game. This is who I am, exactly what I've become. Devil Lady, 1998. If you guys are wondering what happens to the Earth after God bombs it following Satan's tragic showdown with the love of his life in Devil Man, then you don't have to wait too long for an answer, because Devil Lady is that answer. Unlike its predecessor show, Devil Lady didn't get the remake treatment, but like Devil Man, it follows a very similar structure. The protagonist this time is John Fudo, a woman who, after getting violated by some demons, turns into a devil lady herself and is recruited to work for a secret government organization that hunts down creatures like her by another woman called Lan Asuka. As the story progresses, many of the original Devilman series themes resurface, but with the twist that they're now being spoken of from the female perspective, and it makes all the difference in the world. More than once, this show approaches the theme of sexual violence and exploitation with such bluntness that it would make you think Think about what kind of substances the Japanese were using in the 90s. There's a particularly disgusting episode where a woman has her brother tied up in her basement because his devil beast syndrome manifestation, which is an awful penile monster, produces an addictive aphrodisiac that exceeds any kind of normal sense of pleasure. Devil Lady is also to save the man from his sister and all the girls that they'd imprisoned as well, but she ends up being unable to resist the allure of tasting the aphrodisiac herself. Go Nagai often takes his stories to extreme places, and despite having a short 26 episode run, Devil Lady puts that fact on full display. Though Akira Fudo doesn't directly appear in the show, he's a prominent part of the Devil Lady manga, where the relationship between him and Jun goes to such weird places that it would make Jamie and Cersei Lannister's relationship look normal. Needless to say, if you are intrigued by Devilman Crybaby, you'll not be disappointed by Devil Lady, which comes with the added bonus of actually having 90s-style animations. <laughs>
2021. There's a reason that this anime inspired horror series with roots in the Philippines was ruling Netflix last year. Fresse is basically Sherlock Holmes merged with the occult, gender swapped and turned into a horror fiction even without Holmes' debilitating drug problems. Our protagonist is Alexandra Trese, a woman in her late 20s who owns a club called Diabolical and also helps the Manila police solve supernatural crimes in the capital city of the Philippines. Because in Trese, entities like the Aswang are real, and so are all the metaphysical concepts from Filipino mythology. This is a show that packs in plenty of punch in a short six-episode run. For example, the first episode sees Trese solving the case of a mysterious subway failure, which ends up in a bloodbath so bad it would make that scene from The Shining look like a joyous waterfall. Every subsequent episode raises the stakes incredibly higher, until Trese is forced to confront demon kind in such a fashion that it ends up taking literal years out of her life. We don't want to talk about this anime more simply because it's one of the most important instances of Filipino literature going mainstream, and would prefer if you just watched it for yourself instead. It's only six episodes, so you can let us know your thoughts on the show in the comment sections below. Exception 2022 The first episode of Exception will make you think that Japanese horror writers are a bit too obsessed with the Alien franchise, but as the episodes progress, it becomes clear that the show is anything but. Our story is set in a future where humanity has left Earth, presumably because it finally became too inhospitable to be called home and taken to the stars. The cast of the show is the crew of a ship that is on their way to planet X-10, their mission being to terraform the place for eventual settlement, except that the crew isn't exactly human. On the ship is a device called the Wound which can create biological copies of the people whose DNA it has stored within it. Since the original crew members are in cryosleep, their copies are the ones who carry out the actual mission. The printing of the first four members of the crew goes fine, but when the fifth is being printed, a malfunction occurs that causes the misprint to come out monstrous and more animalistic than its natural counterpart. A later print is more successful in cloning the man named Lewis, but the hunt is on for the misprint, and from there, the story devolves into a philosophical treatise on identity, self, and the utter disregard with which humanity treats other species and life forms. Misprint Lewis and proper Lewis share the exact same memories and experiences up until the point of printing, which essentially makes them the same person with different personalities. It opens discourse on important conversations that are perhaps more terrifying than any other alien or monster could be. About halfway through the story, another malfunction occurs on the ship, albeit far more mortally dangerous than the misprinting of Lewis, and the entire crew is forced to face the morality of their mission while simultaneously trying to survive on a spaceship steadily leading them to their demise. The 3D animation style of exception actually lends itself to the central theme of the show, which appears to be the idea that in a universe teeming with life, what makes us think we're exceptional. And the inhuman designs of the crew members are enough to tell you what the answer to that question is. <laughs> The Legend of the Overfiend, 1989 If you're aware of anime at any level, or just manga culture in general, you must know about the dreaded fascination that creators have with tentacles. And if you've wondered where all that started from, well, this is the anime that originated the demon of your nightmares, or your fantasies. We don't judge here at Marvelous Video. But even without that one thing that you'll take away about this movie series, The Legend of the Overfiend is something that will stick in your mind, and uh, not in a good way. The story follows protagonist Jack, who among a mischievous man-beast who has been tasked with ensuring the birth of the fabled Overfiend, who will unite the three realms and lead them on to the land of eternity. Oh, that's right. The world that Toshia Maida has created also has parallel universes inhabited by demons and man-beasts like Jaku, respectively, with mankind in the middle. And that's really a good analogy for the series, because the actual Overfiend is a human whose life is fought over by beasts that have nothing to do with him. But what is so scary about this particular piece of horror fiction is its use of sensuality and eroticism to induce bone-chilling terror in your mind. That tentacle thing is just one part of it. The legend of the Overfiend is a debauched land of perverts, sexual deviants, and naked sex offenders whose acts are depicted in as horrific a manner as is humanly possible. Body horror is prominent as well, with some character designs so heinous that it truly makes you wonder how human minds can come up with this stuff. The legend of the Overfiend is not a watch for the faint of heart, as there are moments here that are so shocking it will make you feel like you're watching an animated version of the Serbian film. And that's one distinction your movies do not want to earn. Trust us.
<laughs> Jujutsu Kaisen 2020. If you take away the Juju Stroll segments from each episode and just focus on the main storyline and not the funny character-building fluff that MAPPA have added to the mix, then Jujutsu Kaisen emerges as one of the defining horror mangas of this generation. Yuji Itadori is an ordinary kid with seemingly extraordinary capabilities. He can run faster than the world's fastest sprinter, hit harder than the guy who played the mountain on Game of Thrones, and also possesses far more empathy and emotional depth than anyone his age should have. But things change for the worse rather quickly when he eats a special grade cursed object that resurrects the worst sorcerer to have ever existed in the history of Jujutsu, Ryomen Sukuna. The very first thing that this 1,000-year-old king of curses remarks on upon his emergence is how the world has so many women and children crawling about like maggots, and how it shall be a massacre with a maniacal smile on his face. Though he's eventually thrashed back into Yuji's body by simp magnet Gojo Sensei, don't let any of the latter's antics fool you into thinking that Sukuna is someone Yuji can handle. And Jujutsu Kaisen is an anime that doesn't simply talk about sorcerers and curses through the lens of good versus evil. It's steeped in fictional and literal Japanese schools of philosophy and thought. Buddhism in particular is the foundation upon which Gege Akutami has based his seminal creation, and the tale of JJK is one that constantly forces you to ask yourself, if the curses are the actual human beings, as Jogo says, then how ugly is humanity's soul? how low can we still sink? The arc with Junpei Toshino is a prime example of the kind of distilled dose of horror that Jujutsu Kaisen is. Itadori's naivety and never-give-up demeanor are the typical characteristics of a shunin protagonist, but he exists in a world that is so unlike the general formula that his constant shortcomings in themselves are cause enough for terror. And to make things worse, the first season is literally nothing in the face of what's set to come in the future. Season 2 is going to be adapting the Shibuya incident arc, and if you haven't read the manga yet, then we're just glad you're still Still okay. Yamishibai, Japanese Ghost Stories 2013. Yamishibai is a traditional form of storytelling that originated in Japan. It translates to paper play because the performer, the Kamishibaya, would often travel from one street corner to another, entertaining people with stories that they'd created on paper. Yamishibai takes that storytelling device and turns something that is almost akin to public service into one of the most horrifying anthology series that anime knows. There are 117 episodes in this series, but most of them are about five minutes long, so you won't even realize how quickly you spend through an entire season of the creepy Kamishibaya's terrifying tales. He appears at a park every week at 5pm to tell the children stories based on Japanese folklore and urban legends, and each story is somehow worse than the last. Recapping every episode is going to be a difficult task, as you can tell, but we'll just touch upon three of them to give you an idea of what awaits you should you choose to watch this series. In The Family Rule, Toshiharu uncovers the disturbing secret about his family. Every year, they performed a peculiar ritual to stave off a spirit cursing their family that involved a rather unnerving mask, and things devolved rather quickly from there. In Museum of Taxidermy, a couple tries to take shelter from bad weather at the aforementioned museum, but things start going creepily awry when they realize that the spectators are unnaturally mesmerized by the exhibits, and the exhibits themselves might just be more alive than we are led to believe. Finally, Cherry Blossom tells the tragically lonely tale of a man who survives a car accident, but finds death more alluring than the idea of being alone, showing that body horror and jump scares aren't the only things Yamishibai is great at doing. Combine all this with the dreamy watercolor aesthetic of the show, and you have 117 episodes of surreal short horror fiction at its finest. We definitely recommend you catch up on this series, especially because season 10, the latest season, was released earlier this year and really flips the framing device of the entire show on its head in the most haunting way possible. <laughs> Monster 2004. When you hear the word monster, your mind immediately conjures up an image of some terrifying, inhumane beast on instinct, because that's just how imagination works. Naoki Urasawa's monster, however, is determined to make you realize that the most terrifying creatures on this earth are human beings. Set in late 20th century Central Europe, Monster follows the tale of Dr. Kenzo Tenma's one act of morality and how it led to the birth of one of the most notorious serial killers that the continent had ever seen. In the very first episode, you get a sense of just how murky and immoral the world of Monster is when Tenma is asked to operate on a political figure that bankrolls the hospital he works for, instead of a child that only he can operate on in the entire institution. Institution. Already disillusioned with his oath and its purpose in the face of financial peril, Tanma decides to be a doctor first instead and saves the child's life. But as he does this, the kid's sister, also badly injured, ominously asks Tenma to kill him. Nine years later, 
Tenma is the head of surgery at that same hospital and must now contend with the monster he had saved nine years ago in the form of Johan Leibert. To put it quite simply, Johan is the titular monster of this series, and after seeing his words and actions in play, you'll find it hard to disagree with that assessment. The result of a horrifying human experimentation project in East Germany, Johan grew up with a highly intelligent brain and a highly emotionless heart, which gave him the power to accomplish anything he set his mind to, even senseless acts of murder and inflicting trauma upon unwitting orphans. In one tale, Johann Liebert was able to use his exceptional research and deduction skills to make a man commit suicide by simply playing on the guilt he carried in his heart over murdering an innocent child. In another episode, he convinced the aforementioned orphan boy that he would find his true mother in a red light district, and that if he didn't, that just meant that nobody wanted him. That kid ends up witnessing acts so horrific in that district that it single-handedly convinces him that the world isn't worth living in, and that he might as well leave it since nobody wants him. It's not the savagery of Johann's epic battles or a bloodthirsty feral personality that makes him a monster. It's the complete lack of emotion he shows in the face of any situation he's faced with. When people try to kill him, he happily points at his forehead and talks them into going through with it. <laughs> and if that kind of resolve doesn't scare you, then you just need to watch Monster to understand why it should. Chainsaw Man 2022. This anime has taken the phrase being down bad so seriously that it goes from being a comedy to a horror story real quick. Many elements of Chainsaw Man are inspired by other entries on this list, but what it manages to achieve, quite unlike any of them, is giving you a true sense of what isolation and loneliness can drive one person to do. Denji has always had a bad life. The series opens with his dad leaving him in crushing debt to the Yakuza, so the stakes aren't low from the very beginning. But Chainsaw Man gives Denji a unique debt settlement option, becoming a devil hunter. See, in this world, devils are real, and they're formed by the many fears that humanity contains within their hearts. They can range from something as concrete as a fear of tomatoes to something as abstract as the fear of the future. But one devil is unique amongst them, and that is the one that merges with Denji to turn him into the fabled Chainsaw Man. Denji is the kind of guy that Sigmund Freud would say is completely dominated by his id, and it's hard to say otherwise once you see how easily he falls from a chemo. And that relationship itself is the basis of the true horror of Chainsaw Man. The willingness with which Denji subs to Makima's outlandish demands, all in the hopes of affection and physical intimacy. And Makima herself is a source of many chilling moments that have occurred in the nine episodes that have aired for Chainsaw Man so far. But what is also terrifying about this story is the graphic violence and the sheer revelry with which the characters engage in it. Because unlike humans who become stronger by feeding off of positive emotions, devils grow in strength through negativity. So, in order to unleash the maximum power of a devil-human hybrid, a dangerous mind state is something of a pre Requisite. Denji's fight with the Eternity Devil is proof enough that this lecherous little blonde boy has the potential to become an absolute savage if he were not so focused on being loved by others. And as the final three episodes air, the tragedy of Denji is only going to get more tragic. Chainsaw Man is one of the best new manga anime series of the modern era because it mashes together teenage romance, slapstick comedy, psychological horror, and pure slasher violence into a unique package anchored by a lonely kid and the chainsaw chain in his chest. Ghost Hunt 2006 Being able to tell the future seems like a cool ability when we first think about it, but Ghost Hunt is a series that aims to show you how the greatest gifts can often double as curses. The story is based around the life of Mai Taniyama, a high school girl who inadvertently gets sucked up within the activities of the Shibuya Psychic Research Center when she bumps into the 17-year-old manager of the facility, Kazuya Shibuya. Ghost Hunt is more like what would happen if the Ghostbusters were in high school. Their jobs were more serious than they made it out to be, and if there was a romance bubbling underneath it all as a secondary plotline. But what makes it scary is the fact that these kids are the ones who are taking on paranormal cases that would make an adult's blood run cold. And more more than that, once Mai starts manifesting her powers of foresight, instead of being delighted by it, she's terrified because all her dreams show her the deaths that evil spirits will be causing soon. Ghost Hunt is very effective at using the framing of a scene, the animation style, and the soundtrack in unison to create a tense atmosphere that keeps you on your toes as Mai navigates her own journey. Sadly, the anime never quite caught up to the manga as it ended after a 25-episode run. But on the flip side, 25 episodes isn't a lot, so you can start watching this ASAP if Paranormal detective fiction with a side of love is just the kind of spooky you're looking for. I wanna be Dead Man Wonderland 2011 What's the worst thing that can happen when you're preparing for a school trip? Well, 
If your name is Ganta Igarashi, then the answer is getting accused of mass murder and being sentenced to death in high school. Dead Man Wonderland opens up with a figure called the Red Man showing up outside Ganta's classroom window and massacring everyone within it, except Ganta himself, whom he presents with a mysterious red diamond before escaping. Being the only person who survived the absolute carnage unleashed by this Red Man, Ganta is sentenced to death and sent to Dead Man Wonderland, the only private prison in Japan that doubles as an adventure park, or so the general public thinks anyway. The reality is quite different and horrifying. Dead Man Wonderland is an amusement park of sorts, that much is true, but the amusement is for the sake of filthy rich deviants and their preferred mode of entertainment is gladiatorial combat. In an event called the Carnival Corpse, inmates are made to go through a series of lethal obstacles to earn cast points, which can allow the inmates to make their miserable lives a bit better by buying themselves lavish furniture or candy, which prevents them from dying off of a poison that's injected in their bodies daily via an electric collar. Ganta witnesses the horrors of the Dead Man Wonderland firsthand and is forced to participate in it as a dead man himself. He finds a companion who helps ease his time there, an albino child somewhat lazily named Shiro. But as the story progresses, it becomes clear that even the people Ganta tries to keep close to him as friends aren't going to stop haunting his nightmares. Dead Man Wonderland is a graphic, off-bloody commentary for the curiosity that the human mind is capable of and the dark places it takes said mind in pursuit of the ultimate knowledge. It shows you the immense resilience of the human spirit to withstand any kind of abuse it's subjected to, but also shows you the horrific consequences of those actions so plainly that it'll make you question whether morality is a concept we, as a species, even adhere to anymore. Blood C 2011. If you're a fan of Blood Plus and were hoping to see the Chiropterans back in action, you're going to be thoroughly disappointed, because aside from her name, Saya Kisaragi shares little with her blood-sucking counterparts. Blood C is a story that begins much like a superhero story. Saya is a shy, clumsy, and friendly girl who lives in a secluded village and has a close-knit group of friends by the day. At night, however, she's the deadly shrine protector, whose job it is to keep the shrine and the villagers safe from the Elder Ben a Lovecraftian race of ancient beings whose sole purpose on Earth was to devour humans and derive nutrition from their blood. Blood Sea is not a show for anyone who has even a slight sign of haemophobia, because while the kills themselves might not be as gruesome as some others on the list, the amount of blood that comes gushing out of their bodies is, and that alone is enough to disturb anyone with a sane mind. To top it all off, as the story progresses, Saya realizes that there's a far darker reason for her being able to fend off the Elder Ben the way she does, and it makes her question and reevaluate her entire life whilst attempting to stay true to the ideals that she now possesses. Blood Sea is equal parts moral dilemma and a pure bloodbath, and that middle ground is where its horror element flourishes. If her outlook on life had not been different at the start of the show, Saya could have easily been Blood Sea's femme fatale. The only reason she isn't is because of an oath she forgot long ago, and the consequences of it are what the series actually ends up exploring. Don't you touch her! Demon Slayer Kimetsu no Yaiba In yet another world where creatures that want to kill and devour humans play the primary antagonists, Tanjiro Kamado finds himself in a damning predicament. Being the sole owner of his family, he would often head out to sell charcoal in the nearby market and return home late at night. Only one night, he returned to the site of a bloodbath. His family had been attacked and brutally slaughtered by a demon, creatures with mythical powers and a thirst for human flesh, and the sole survivor was his sister Nazuko, who was turned into a demon herself though she retained her human spirit and emotions. He swears to find a cure for his sister's condition and embarks on a journey that would transform his entire life. Demon Slayer is a show that focuses on the titular Demon Slayers taking care of business, and that business is the demons themselves, who were nearly indestructible beings fueled purely by negative emotions and feral bloodlust. In his quest to protect and hopefully revert his sister to normalcy, Tanjiro ends up feeling the nightmares of demon kind himself when he trains for and joins the Demon Slayer Corps. But to be completely honest with you guys, sometimes we feel bad for the demons that go up against him because he somehow feels more like a monster than them. And then there are all the gory instances of people being squashed to death and the horrifying designs of some of the higher level demons to consider. Demon Slayer is a beautiful anime, with some of the best background designs and character designs we've ever seen. But the clash between the definition of their art styles makes your viewing experience inherently disconnected from the narrative, and as Tanjiro's journey progresses, that disconnect manifests in his own personality. If you want to see a show with fantastic visuals, simple to understand power systems and scaling, and a slice of horror action adventure goodness, then hop on the Demon Slayer wave before it drowns you.
Humanoid Monster Bem, 1968. Okay, technically this show is titled Evil Spirit Human Bem, but Humanoid Monster Bem just conveys the point of its themes better, so we're going to roll with it. One of the oldest shows on this list also has to be one of the purest. Humanoid Monster Bem is an anime whose premise is classic horror, but whose structure is flipped on its head. Instead of trying to destroy the human society that they're part of, these humanoid monsters actually want to become human themselves, and that is the dissonance with which we must navigate the story of Humanoid Monster Bem. Its protagonists are the aforementioned Bem, a female yokai called Bella and a young yokai called Bello. All three of them, despite being spirit humans themselves, desire to live normal human lives, and the horror of the show comes from their struggle to achieve just that. For instance, in the first episode of the series, Bello saves this young girl that he met from a massive yokai attacking their city. But in the process, he exposes his yokai form to her, which makes her recoil from him and later wonder how she could have been friends with a monster like him. Bello's desire to become human and make normal friends is reinforced by Bem and Bella at the end of that episode, but this struggle permeates through the entire show, and for someone who's struggling with finding or accepting their identity in the world, the relatability can be a little too spot on for comfort. Still, the optimism with which these three yokai, literal demon spirits, want to become human is enough to make us recommend it to you. Well. That and the animation style really lends itself to some decent jump scares and wacky character designs. So, you know, enjoy it as a relic from an era that was perhaps more creatively free than the one we live in right now. Elfin Lied 2004. Usually, you see a character with pink hair in an anime, and you instantly write them off as a stereotypical character. Sakura from Naruto is probably the greatest example of this weird semi-trope. But don't make that mistake with Lucy, because unlike Miss Haruno, she'll rip you apart with no effort and without a shred of doubt in her being. Elf and Lied opens with one of the most brutal prison breaks we've ever seen, and the stakes remain at their peak levels throughout its short 13-episode run. Our protagonist is the aforementioned Lucy, who has pink hair, pink eyes, and a couple of really cute horns protruding from her head that make her look like an elf. But Lucy is not an elf. In fact, she's a Declonius, a mutated offshoot of the human species whose sole purpose it appears is to replace humanity with their own kind. At the beginning of the series, she was being held captive in a research facility where she was being experimented on by the psychotic chief director of the Declonius Research Institute. After escaping, Lucy sustains a head injury which causes her to develop a childlike split personality named No, which is nothing like her actual self. Where No is innocent and borderline oblivious to things happening around her, Lucy is a cold-hearted Declonius who's both the progenitor and propagator of their life's ambition. But what's really scary about Elfenlied is the fact that it's actually a love story, and the way that Lucy achieves her love is so tragic, it becomes horrifying. Abused from a young age for how different she was, Lucy endures tragedy after tragedy at the hands of humanity to the extent that she develops a deep hatred for them. An incident where three boys abuse her pet dog into a mortal crisis causes her to manifest her vector powers, and things quickly go downhill from there. Elfin Light's cute character aesthetic is the perfect contrast for the sheer bloodbath that its plot demands and the dissonance created because of that contrast is such a shock to the senses that you'll probably want to wait a few days before going from episode 1 to episode 2. If you like romances that come with an undercurrent of existential threat, then Elfin Lied is what you've been looking for. Serial Experiments, Lane, 1998 in today's environment, where the virtual seems to be replacing the real at every step, Serial Experiments Lane serves more as a warning than a medium of entertainment, especially when you consider the massive leaps that things like VR have made. Lane Iwakura is a teenage high school student who lives at home with a detached mother, a tech-obsessed father, and a sister who might as well not be there. In the very first episode, one of Lane's classmates ends up taking her own life, falling through an environment that would honestly put Blade Runner to shame. The next day, everyone is mourning her loss except Lane, who doesn't really use technology unlike the rest of the tech-obsessed world. But when her peers get an email from their supposedly dead classmate telling them she'd simply discarded her physical form and found God in the digital realm world called The Wired, Lane's entire life unravels in front of her eyes as a big, fat lie. Serial Experiments Lane is a show that understands obsession, technological advancement, and emotions very well, and uses those things to generate psychological horror that will hit you at a cellular level. What are we? Why are we put on this earth? What is our true purpose? Most of us can answer these questions because we've had help shaping ourselves as our lives have moved along. But for Lane, these are fundamental issues that she has to explore over the course of 13 episodes. 
And the answer is such a depressingly powerful one that you'll come to see ideas of immortality and omniscience differently if you connect with her tale. Serial Experiments Lane's cyberpunk-esque aesthetic and haunting soundtrack also ensure that you feel exactly what its creators want you to feel. And once you get to the different lanes that populate this world, there'll be no going back for you. It's one of the best character-driven horrors that we have on our list, and if you're into dystopias about technology and how we're all becoming slaves to our devices, then this is the show for you. The final revelation and acceptance that allows Lane to finally find herself and exist in peace is such a hollow one that you realize even eternity isn't the boon it's often made out to be. The Flowers of Evil 2013. Oftentimes, horror fiction focuses on self-expression being an obstacle for the protagonist because there are things about us that we really don't want the world to know. Our most controversial opinions, our darkest secrets, and our perversions are things that should normally be kept private. But The Flowers of Evil is a series that exposes those very things and makes you feel disgusted for having similar drives and desires. Katao Kasuga lives in a small town and is a huge fan of Charles Baudelaire's The Flowers of Evil. He thinks that he's the only person in his town who can truly understand the philosophy behind Baudelaire's writings and craves to leave it all behind so he can finally lead the life he wants to. He has a massive crush on his class's most popular girl, Seiki, but towards the end of episode 1, you start to get a sneak peek into Kasuga's inner conflict with his desire to be a good person. When he steals Seiki's clothes from a bathhouse, he's caught in the act by his class outcast, Sawa Nakamura, and thus begins a triangular relationship that explores both sides of Kasuga's personality, his desire to be good and his desire for Seiki. Though he insists that his understanding of Baudelaire's writing is purely philosophical, it becomes evident quickly that the reality is anything but that. Nakamura takes it upon herself to make him realize his inner pervert was real and forces him into a contract that can only be termed as bizarre. The stuff that these three high school students get up to in the name of understanding themselves and the nature of love is highly disturbing, because the flowers of evil captures the essence of what unchecked lust can do to a person, and it's far scarier than encountering ghosts or something of that ilk, because lust is an emotion we as humans can inherently relate to. And when it's evoked in such a blatantly exploitative fashion, it's hard to feel anything but terror when you witness it firsthand. The fact that this anime is made entirely with rotoscoping techniques only adds to the creepiness of some of the things that Kamira puts Kasugo up to, and the ending is a true masterclass in how to unnerve your audience with the prospect of the future, whilst leaving them satisfied with your story at the same time. You'll not be experiencing jump scares or scream queen moments when you watch The Flowers of Evil. You'll feel exposed to the point that you'll feel naked despite being fully clothed, and that is where its horror will spring at you, literally strip you and force you to wear the undergarments of the girl you like just because it can. Also, because Nakamura-san said so. Hell Girl 2005-2006 One of the basic tenets of an unforgiving society is that at every turn of the road, you'll be faced with an insurmountable challenge. The strength of a person's character is what usually allows them to get out of an unfair situation and grow as a person themselves. But let us ask you this. What if you could delete your bully from existence tomorrow? What if you could get rid of your abusive spouse or aggressive and debauched parent by simply typing in their names on a website and condemning them to literal hell? There's only one catch, though. Your soul is the price you'll pay for retribution, and it's that concept that makes Hell Girl such a creepy and effective horror anime. The story is centered around the concept of Hell being a real thing, and is anchored around the services provided by an enigmatic red-eyed girl called Ai Enma. The service she provides is quite simple in its terms. If you're someone who holds a particularly large grudge against another person, then you can send that person to Hell by tapping their name on her website and ridding yourself of their influence for the rest of your human life. However, once you've passed from your mortal coil, your soul will belong to the Master of Hell, who appears to Ai as an arachnid with three eyes on its abdomen and you'll never experience the tranquility of heaven. Just like the person you've condemned to the netherworld, you too shall be cursed to walk its fiery roads once you die. And so the choice becomes a dilemma in itself, one that generates the basis for much of Hellgirl's horror elements. It's not a series that's overtly graphic with its portrayal of Iron Mist services. In fact, Hellgirl's overall aesthetic is rather beautiful. But that same aesthetic lends a certain eeriness to the show that becomes evident once eye services are accepted and put to work. And the time that you don't spend questioning just what kind of a person you have to be to willingly condemn others and yourself to hell is spent exploring the deeply tragic past of eye, which is just riddled with social injustices, betrayals, and 
pure, unadulterated rage. You'll realize soon enough that the quasi-angel of death and her ragtag group of pals have a past that you're just not prepared for, and at the same time have probably seen at work in the real world at some point in your life. It's then that you'll realize that the hell correspondence is the most damning kind of temptation given form, and that is revenge. Boogie Pop Phantom 2000 Urban legends are extremely fascinating to us because they're a genre of fables that most of us can actually relate to. We live in an urbanized world, with more and more of our 8 billion strong population favoring city life when compared to the country. And because of that, urban legends involving strange serial killers and white-clothed women leading men to their doom have become such a popular device for horror stories. It's through that lens that you should watch Boogie Pop Phantom, because it's perhaps one of the best surrealist depictions of urban horror we've ever come across. Five years ago, a string of murders committed by a serial killer rocked the city where our story is set in. One month before the events of the series, a mysterious pillar of light appeared that killed someone who was mysteriously returned to life. And to top things off, the people decided to cope with this by blaming it all on the Boogie Pop, an urban legend who allegedly kidnapped young women at the peak of their beauty so they might be spared the thought of dying ugly. As the story unravels, it becomes clear rather quickly that none of these things are actually true, and the truth is where the horror of the show lies. Boogie Pop Phantom is a story about how the idea of evolving into a higher being isn't exactly the blessing most people think it is, and its main antagonist is someone who's surviving by eating human beings in the guise of that same mystery person we spoke of earlier. Many stories in this show focus on people losing control of themselves rather easily, even if said acts were committed with good intentions, and the horrifying consequences of what happens when boundaries stop existing. Towards the end, it throws in a temporal subplot that will make you look at red balloons differently for the rest of your lives, but also gives the villain of the story such a visually beautiful death that it will leave you questioning what it was all for in the first place. Helsing Ultimate 2006 An off-the-books Vatican chapter dedicated to wiping out supernatural threats for the church, a group of clandestine Nazis who have re-emerged after decades of isolation with the infamous Last Battalion and a secret organization that defeated the original Count Dracula fight for the very soul of the Earth. In this maniacal horror anime, whose protagonist is the definition of badass and terrifying at the same time, a definite upgrade from its 2001 predecessor and far more grounded in the gory reality of Kuta Hirano's manga. Helsing Ultimate is perhaps the defining vampire anime for a lot of otakus because of how well it delves into that genre and how it tackles the idea of a legion of Nazi-made vampires painting the world red, which is also its primary colour tone. The Helsing Organization, aka the Royal Order of Protestant Knights, is tasked with securing the defence of the United Kingdom from all supernatural threats, primarily vampires, and they do so by employing the OG Count himself. Alucard is the definition of a demon working for an angel. He's brash, arrogant, violent, frantic, and more than willing to commit horrible acts of sin against his enemies. His red coat and jacket meld with the hellscape that's the setting of Helsing Ultimate, making him appear more like Millennium than Helsing, and amplifying the terror of an already terrifying situation. Seriously, if you think that Alucard fighting for the good guys at least makes things better, go look up the Bird of Hermes scene from Helsing on YouTube, and ask yourself if this is what he's doing as a good guy to the bad guys, then what would he do if he actually turned over to the dark side once again? Endlessly intriguing endlessly entertaining and endlessly horrifying. Helsing is the perfect introduction to the fantastic world of horror anime for all, even you, marvelous viewer. Ergo Proxy 2006 What if you were to find out one day that the life you've known is a complete lie and your actual history was destroyed thousands of years ago? That is perhaps the biggest theme of the existential dread that is Ergo Proxy. Set thousands of years after mankind was forced into domed cities due to an ecological disaster that left the rest of the planet uninhabitable, Ergo Proxy focuses on the story of Ray Al an intelligence officer tasked with investigating a string of bizarre murders. See, this post-apocalyptic cyberpunk society is one where humans and androids coexist in perfect, controlled harmony thanks to the highly organized nature of society. But the murders that Rael is investigating were committed by the androids, who are normally supposed to not be self-aware. As Rael investigates the mysterious virus that is causing them to break out of the illusion, she realizes that her entire life history has been one as well, and the man that she was thinking was helping her out of the humanity of his heart was actually something closer to God himself. 
Ergo Proxy is a highly philosophical anime that generates its trauma through emotional self-reflection and the maximum of lacking a reason to live. Descartes famously said, I think, therefore, I am. And you can think of that phrase as the fabric with which Ergo Proxy's tale has been woven. The revelations that Rael's relationship with Iggy and Vincent bring to her about her own planet and her ancestors are enough to fill anyone with despair. Human beings are artificially produced in the world of Ergo Proxy because the government tells them they can no longer reproduce as a species. And that is just accepted. In many ways, it functions like George Orwell's 1984 in that everything is designed to keep you thinking the way you're supposed to be thinking. And when you rebel and try to seek the truth, you're left with a revelation so horrifying that you'd rather wish the illusion were still real to you. The World Yamizuken 2017 If you guys found the avant-garde concept of Mononoke and the Kamishibai format of Yamishibai in Japanese ghost stories interesting, then this is another anime that will pique your interest. The World Yamizuken is a horror anthology that's presented more in the form of still animation rather than the fluid graphics that we've come to expect from modern studios. And while some might think it detracts from the viewing experience, we think it actually adds to it. Think of watching this anime as listening to the world's creepiest picture book, and you'll get what we mean. Each story focuses on a different kind of taboo mystery of the world and uses it to tell a quick five-minute horror story, more effectively than some modern horror authors. A man suspects his wife of adultery and follows her one night, only to find himself at the mercy of otherworldly visitors. A boy instructed specifically to not go outside on a snowy night does exactly what he's told not to do and befriends a snowman who harbors a sinister secret. Crop circles suddenly form on a family farm, created by some unexpected visitors, whose actions have hideous consequences for said family. All of these stories are told with stills and different art styles, set within the framing device of you reading them from a book that's like the Encyclopedia of the Damned. Some of the stories and transitions within them are so jarring and unexpected that it'll make you look at watercolors a certain type of way. But to get why we're touting it as an underrated horror anthology, you're gonna have to stick with it until the bitter, horrifying end. Kajiwani 2015 You've heard of unidentified flying objects, right? Well, get ready to meet their terrestrial and aquatic counterparts, the unidentified mysterious animals that lie at the heart of Kajiwani. Suzuki Banba is a brilliant scientist who excels in the field of genetics, but to his great horror, the world is seeing increasing cases of cryptids coming to life. Cryptozoology is the conspiracy theorist wing of the animal kingdom. The Loch Ness Monster, the Jersey Devil, Bigfoot, and the Yeti. They've been the inspirations for countless stories for children and adults alike. Yet, when employed with the eerie art style of Kajiwani, which is reminiscent of paper dolls and is rather similar to the aesthetic of Yamishibai, these creatures take on an aura of otherworldly terror. Banba's job is quite simple. As a genetics expert and scientist first and foremost, he wants to either capture or kill these rampant kaiju whose very existence is threatening mankind. But here's the thing. Like many other shows on this list, the history of these cryptids is deeply connected to the history of humanity itself, and Suzuki Banba ends up learning that firsthand. Keeping the more philosophical aspects aside, what Kajiwana also excels at is pacing. The very first episode shows you a group of teenagers trying to capture evidence of a cryptid in a forest, only for the cryptid to devour them instead. The events that transpire here aren't exactly out of the ordinary for a horror anime, but the way it's executed is so menacing that watching the cryptid emerge like a specter of death actually works for once in a genre genre that is saturated with underwhelming jump scares. Ayakashi Samurai Horror Tales 2006. Ayakashi Samurai Horror Tales is also alternatively called Ayakashi Classic Japanese Horror because this three-part series adapts two classic horror plays from Japanese theatre and has an unsettling original which we've already spoken of in this list, after a fashion, of course. The first story is a retelling of Yotsuya Kaidan, which is a prime example of the vengeful spirit trope in Japanese literature. A ronin samurai kills the father of the girl he loves to clear the path to marry her, but unbeknownst to him, a similar event transpires with her sister that very same night. The two perpetrators cover up their crimes and accomplish their goals of marrying the sisters, but soon, the ronin begins to resent the woman he loves and conspires to kill her and marry someone else. This turns Oiwa's soul into a vengeful spirit that haunts her ex-husband into such paranoia that he would make the Joker seem half-sane. Yotsuya Ghost Story is a damning picture of greed and the extent to which a person is willing to go to to get what they want, but it's nothing in comparison to the next story. Tenshu Monogotari, which is also called the Goddess of the Dark Tower. A story of forbidden love between two Romeo and Juliet type figures, the conflict arises when the Juliet of the story realizes her Romeo works with demons and is there to collect her mother's soul for his overlord and gives in anyway. 
The battle scene is one of the most graphic and badass displays of violence we've seen in any medium of entertainment that has an aesthetic as beautiful as Ayakashi's. But what makes this story even more unnerving is its opening scene, where a group of bandits are straight up drained of their lives by demonic spirits posing as beautiful women. These classics are simple, and some might not even look at them as horror stories except for the Mononoke cameo towards the end. But we think you should check them out regardless because they're a slice of classical Japanese theatre that you might not get to experience elsewhere. Ghost Hound 2007 Imagine a nightmare on Elm Street was based in a hilly Japanese town, and instead of Freddy Krueger in the dreamscape, it was actually paranormal and populated by more than one being. That's basically the premise of Ghost Hound, which somehow manages to pull off blending the psychological with the paranormal. Taro is a narcoleptic 14-year-old kid who suffers from extreme PTSD because of an incident that happened 11 years ago where he and his sister were kidnapped and only he managed to survive. The incident didn't just affect him, his entire family is broken. His father, a sake maker, prefers to drown out his emotions in a private music room by blasting jazz on full volume, with the music representing his inner turmoil. His mother has been taking medication to help her get out of her grief, but still feels deeply hurt whenever someone brings up the death of her daughter, upon which her left eye starts twitching. As for Taro, he's been seen by a therapist and a neurologist, all in an effort to maintain his sanity and seek a possible explanation for the out-of-body experiences he keeps having, where he witnesses paranormal phenomena take place. The series explores Taro's psyche, along with that of his friends Makoto and Mayasuki, and his romantic interest Miyako, and gives you a terrible revelation. Not only is the spirit world real, but it is also the source of all the trauma that our main characters are carrying with them, and holds the key to ending their misery once and for all. But it's the interplay between Taro's therapy work with him in the reality of the situation that makes the scary moments of Ghost Hound extra effective. The show doesn't have a large number of horror elements at play, but what it lacks in quantity, it makes up for with the quality of its pacing and world building. The expositional dissonance between Taro's therapist's explanation for his mental health issues and the truth of the spirit world's existence makes the moment of discovery a wonder and a terror, and it's capturing that precise moment that Ghost Hound excels at. If you want to watch a psychological horror where you actually come out learning something about the former discipline, and this is the show for you. <laughs> the Promised Neverland 2019. Imagine living an entire life at an orphanage, being promised that one day you'll be adopted by a loving family who will give you the life that you've always dreamed of, only to realize that you are nothing but a piece of livestock. In reality, that is what the children of the promised Neverland must contend with when they discover the truth behind the false love their mother showers them with. The show focuses on the exploits of Emma, Ray, and Norman, three orphans who are being raised at the Gracefield house under seemingly idyllic conditions. They're well-fed, well-clothed, have a good community of peers around them, and their warden, aka Mother Isabella, was the closest thing to a parent any of them had ever known. Emma, Ray, and Norman were also blessed with incredible intellectual acumen, scoring exceptional scores on the standardized tests that Gracefield House administered to its students every once in a while. The place prioritized education and good health, all markers of an institution designed to produce healthy and productive individuals into the world, until they learned the secret of their facility. They were not living in the world they had been led to believe they were living in. Following one of their peers who got adopted one day, Emma and Norman discover that Gracefield House is not a paradise for orphans like them, but a farm that rears exceptional humans for the consumption of rich and powerful demons. From there, it becomes a journey of understanding why they've been put in such a revolting predicament, and devising a plan to get out of there, which sounds like a simple task, but is more than what something a few pre-teens could have ever bargained for. Along the way, Emma and Ray also understand that not all demons are inherently evil for wanting to eat humans, as Emma even learns to empathize with the demons that are later attacked by Norman. The Promised Neverland is an anime that truly makes you understand why vegan activists are so adamant about abolishing breeding factories, because it puts human beings in that same position, and dares us to really think about what the cost of freedom is in face of a life that supposedly gives you everything you could have asked for and more. More Ida. Dorohidoro. 2020. MAPPA has finally brought Q Hayashida's masterful dystopian world of Dorohidoro to life. And where do we even begin with this one? There are three worlds that are constantly at odds with one another. One where humans reside, one where sorcerers reside, and one where demons reside with their progenitor, Jidorama. The protagonist of the series is Kaiman, a human with the head of a lizard who is somehow immune to magic and is simultaneously on a quest to kill every sorcerer in his path until he finds out who did this to him. In the sorcerer's world, the N family is by 
by far the greatest, and their patriarch's special ability will make you think twice before you eat mushrooms the next time. And well, the devils themselves are creatures who take the idea of Cenobites to the extreme. Utterly drunk on power, lawlessness, pleasure, and insanity. Humans, being the weakest of the three societies, are naturally subject to intense persecution from the other two, which is reflected by the fact that their world is called the Hole. It's also a reference to a literal hole created by the toxicity of the smoke-based magic of this universe's sorcerers and the bodies of humans that refuse to decompose. And just to make things even more confusing and terrifying, Kaiman isn't exactly one person. Dorohidoro is a horror story that revels in the bloodbath that it frequently orchestrates whilst giving its worst characters such charming personalities that you can't entirely hate them despite their horrific acts. Q's body horror art has been done full justice by Mappa, and the fact that even in a society like that of the sorcerers, castes exist to differentiate the more powerful from the most powerful. Just goes to show you that literally no one is safe in this world and everyone is just trying to survive the best they can. And if we're being completely honest with you, Shin's literal heart-shaped mask that was created out of the divine vomit of a devil is enough to give us nightmares for weeks no matter how goofy his relationship with the brutal yet charming Noi might be. <laughs> Paprika, 2006. Ah, yes. The inspiration for Inception and infamously the final movie that Satoshi Kon ever got to make, Paprika is another existential thriller that plays on some of our most primal fears with such nuance and absurdity that it's hard not to be a little shaken by the time it's ended. The story focuses on the tale of Dr. Atsuko Chiba, whose team has managed to make Sigmund Freud's dream a reality. With the help of a machine called the DC Mini, created by Dr. Kosaku Toshita, the team has made it possible to enter dreams and resolve conflicts deep within a person's subconscious, thereby making their lives better by improving their mental health. But things go awry when three of the prototypes of the DC Mini are stolen by someone, and the chase is on. Using her dream world self called Paprika, Atsuko must now determine who stole the machines and recover them before something too bad takes place. Paprika is a surrealist feast for those of you who love that kind of stuff. Because of its abstract and absurdist nature, Satoshi Kon is able to pack in many references to social ills within the Japanese society within the larger story of blurring the lines between what is real and what isn't. The parade scene that this movie is infamous for begins with men gleefully jumping off a building, referencing the high suicide rates in Japan, and then goes on to address other issues with escalating tension and surreal terror. The end of the movie is a bizarre mix of love and surrender, which leads to the birth of a being whose existence is both reviling and necessary at the same time. Paprika is a movie that will bombard you with so many things at once that the sheer sensory overload will make you scream out in terror. And trust us when we say, that means the movie is working. Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust. 2000. Oftentimes, Vampire Hunter D's setting might feel like someone just decided to take all their favorite genres and mash them all into one. It's a western, a gothic romance, a cyberpunk resistance anime, a Lovecraftian horror and a dark fantasy all rolled into a neat package that follows the story of D, a hybrid half-human, half-vampire who is also a vampire hunter, as the title of the movie suggests. D's mission in Bloodlust is simple. He must retrieve the daughter of a wealthy human who has been kidnapped by a vampire nobleman. But along the way, his quest to recover the princess is hindered by other groups who are looking for Charlotte. The discriminatory views that the humans of every town he goes to hold towards vampires and half-breeds like him, and the original Dracula in the form of Countess Carmilla, whose tale predates Bram Stoker's Dracula in the real world. Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust will make you question a lot of things, including whether you, like Charlotte, are going to be hypnotized by the ethereal beauty of the vampires or not because that plays a huge role in the story. The fight scenes between the various parties are bloody and brutal as it is, but it's the betrayals and the horrifying consequences of trusting too much that form the true core of this movie's horror. Maya and Charlotte came to their refuge in hopes of escaping to the space haven that vampires had created for themselves, called the City of the Night. Instead, they're forced to contend with baser, more human obstacles to realizing their love, and in the end, only one of them is able to achieve their dream. These actions, while well, justified in a sense, also paint a vivid picture of the kind of moral dichotomy that many Japanese horror stories evoke so well. The surreal art style and the haunting OST only serve to enhance the feeling of absolute dread and wonder you have whenever the nobility shows up on the screen, and the ending is as beautiful as it is tragic. Sankaria, 2013. If you're the type of person who thinks kinks related to bodily wastes are disgusting, then just wait till you watch this anime. Because boy oh boy, does it take things to a weird place. Chihiro Furuya is a seemingly normal high school student who has a cat called Babu, and parents who are devotees of Shintoism. He just has one personality trait that makes him a unique existence. 
is obsessed with zombies. He spends most of his time watching zombie movies, reading old manuscripts about them, and discussing his love for them with anyone who would listen. When his cat passes away, he creates a potion to resurrect it, but his true dream is to kiss a zombie girl. And to his equal delight and horror, his wish is granted when the girl he likes, Rare, takes his potion and becomes a zombie herself. Being into the undead is a decidedly unsettling fetish, yes. But what's somehow crazier is the way zombies work in this world, because they tend to feed on the very people that they catch feelings for, which means that your hero's new girlfriend wants to eat him because she loves him. And if that isn't a better story than Titanic, well, <laughs> we don't know what is. A lot of Sankaria's horror comes from playing on personal, taboo emotions and relationships. Rhea's relationship with her parents and your hero's love for a zombie girl are both treated as backrap crazy by everyone who leads a normal life. And yet, when the infamous festival feeding incident takes place, Chihiro doesn't disparage the girl he loves. His selfless affection for Rhea makes you temporarily forget the absolutely bizarre premise of the series, and if you hadn't forgotten it, then you know just how creepy Chihiro's position is in truth. Sankaria takes the concept of forbidden love to places where they should not go, and thrives because of that. If those kinds of stories are your thing, then you should definitely check this anime out. My School of the Dead 2010. Imagine you're just chilling in school one day, trying to mind your business and ignore the girl you love because she's now dating your best friend, and suddenly you're attacked by a horde of zombies. Well, that's how this anime begins, and it never really hits the brakes either. High School of the Dead came out a few years before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, but many of its instances can be seen as parallels for what transpired in our world from 2019 up until, well, even today. The zombies are created as a result of a virus that spreads virulently, taking over the entire world in a matter of days. The zombies it creates are vicious, violent, and not averse to messing up shopping complexes in the wake of their destruction. In the first episode itself, protagonist Takashi Komuro is forced to take a baseball bat to his best friend's head because he'd been bitten by a zombie. And maybe that's all we need to say about the personal stakes involved in the story. As for the political, well, let's just say that a zombie apocalypse triggered the sternest response possible from any major country in the world. And people who were working at the International Space Station, <laughs> ironically the safest place for humans in light of the outbreak, thought they were witnessing the end of the world when they saw atomic ICBMs fly from the west to the east and vice versa. That's right, High School of the Dead made World War III happen before Putin did, and that isn't exactly a compliment either. The story devolves into a maniacal bid for survival towards the end, as hope is stamped out or chomped on by the zombies at every turn. It's the kind of zombie movie that you really want to end already because of all the mindless violence, but you also can't at the same time out of sheer morbid curiosity. It's an entirely different take on zombies from Sankaria, and <laughs> not nearly as disturbing, but far more devastating in its scale, which trumps a high school kid's creepy fetish in our books. Shigurui Death Frenzy 2007. How far are you willing to go in pursuit of your goals, or alternatively, your revenge? That's the question that Shigurui asks its viewers, but the answer the show gives you is, there is no limit to what one man can do in service of his goals. The show is set in the Edo era and opens with a request for a traditional duel between two samurai, but with real steel instead of wooden swords, as is the custom. A man vehemently opposes the proposal, and to state his point literally pulls his own guts out to show you the consequences of such a duel. That's how Shigurui begins, and the violence and bloodshed only keeps increasing with each passing episode. The life of a samurai is one romanticized with heroic, honorable, and chivalrous ideals, but Shigurui shows you the reality. Warriors are all berserkers whose primary thirst were blood and lust. The sensei whose shadow looms over the series, Kogan Iwamoto, is a man who spends three out of the four seasons as a deranged madman, only regaining his sanity from fall through winter. But he's also the developer of the deadliest sword art technique and it's the pursuit of his knowledge and wealth that drives two men to commit various acts of atrocities with such ease as if they were a natural part of their life cycles. The protagonist, Janosuke Fujiki, once tested his blaze edge by introducing it to the necks of six blindfolded criminals, and the animators ensured that you would feel every inch of their pain and horror as he did so. In fact, the graphic and in-your-face nature of the violence of Shigurui, combined with its absurd and creepy art style, is enough to put the creeps in your skin. As you keep watching it, that feeling only intensifies, and the abrupt ending is one that leaves you with a vague sense of satisfaction, because at least you didn't have to sit through the carnage that was about to come. Shigurui is not for the faint of heart, so watch it only at your own risk. But if gore and samurai swords are your thing, then this show is perfect for you. Blue Gender 1999 
In 2009, Yuji Kaido developed a mysterious chronic disease that required him to go into cryogenic stasis as humanity didn't have a treatment for it in their time. In 2031, he wakes up from his stasis thinking a cure had finally been found, only to discover that the world he'd known and the world he'd woken up to were in fact two entirely different places. Humanity no longer inhabited Earth as its dominant species. That role had been usurped by the monstrous alien-like entities known to human survivors only as the Blue. It's in this nightmarish hellscape that Yuji must learn how to survive alongside the cold and rational Marlene as they find a path to second Earth and uncover secrets about their alien predators along the way. Blue Gender is yet another tale about a post-apocalyptic existential crisis, but it takes on an added evolutionary dimension that makes you question whether the people of second Earth can even be called human beings. Yuji went under at a time when society was still relatively stable and woke up to find humans indifferent to every emotion except the instinct to survive. More than once, he curses his condition for taking his life away from him and questions the meaning of it all. And once he realizes the truth about the B-cells, despair is not far behind him, much like the blue themselves. It's a gripping tale of the excesses of mankind and the response that nature might one day have to it. But if you're someone who's terrified of evolution as a concept entirely, then you should probably stay away from this show as much as you can. King of Thorn 2009. And the final entry on our list is something of a combination of Blue Gender, Perfect Blue, Paprika and Dorohiduro, but is none of them at the same time. We'll explain. King of Thorn opens with a beautiful girl plunging off of a high-rise building, but when her body hits the ground, it's turned into smashed stone. An epidemic called the Medusa virus was causing humans to turn into petrified stone, and the Russian company Venus Gate decided to take it upon themselves to find the cure. Kasumi, a young teenage girl, was chosen as one of the volunteers for their program and placed in cryostasis, only to emerge from it and find the entire room filled with disgusting bat-like monsters and countless thorns. As the rest of her volunteer brethren woke up from their slumber, it became evident that they were in a life-or-death scenario as a swarm of monsters began attacking them. Many subjects attempted to escape through the elevator shaft, completely unaware that they were falling directly into the stomach of a monster. That's the start of this movie, which then veers into a deadly game of cat and mouse with an added layer of tragedy that can only happen in something as abstract as a dream. Turns out, the protagonist we've been following isn't exactly real, and the goal she chases throughout the movie is actually the source of all its problems. Towards the end, the castle that Kasumi and co were trapped in turns into a living dragon made out of thorns. And that is honestly not even the craziest thing that happens in King of Thorn, a psychological thriller with perfect creature designs and one of the best ending sequences in our opinion. This is one movie that every horror enthusiast should watch. King of Thorn is tragic, beautiful, scary, awe-inspiring, devastating, and fulfilling all at the same time, and will leave you feeling overwhelmed, even without intending to. Marvelous Verdict and that's our list. Let us know which of these you've seen in the past or would want to see in the future in the comments below. And like, subscribe, and share it with those friends of yours who are looking for some new horror content to binge on. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.